This is Lend Me Your Ear. It's joint work with Daniel Genkin, Naomi Sun, and Iran Tromer. Um, and it's about side channels. And we have two, we usually talk about two si types of side channels, software, uh, where the attacker is um, timing their own computation while either sharing a resource with the victim or interacting with the victim. And then the timing uh, patterns of the attacker reveal the access patterns of the victim. Uh, but this talk is more about physical side channels where the attacker uh, actually puts a physical probe next to a victim device. And uh, by analyzing the emissions uh, from the victim's device, they can uh, tell something about what the victim device is doing, what secrets it holds, um, et cetera. And passive uh, physical, sorry, physical side channels are nice because they are passive. They don't need the sense that they don't need to, you don't need to execute any code on the target. You don't need to interact with the target at all. All you need to do is measure the target's emissions externally to the device. But this does require physical proximity. You have to put, to attach the, the probe next, physically next to the device, and that can be mitigated and maybe it's exclu excluded from some threat models. So what we really want is a physical side channel attack that can be done completely remotely. So today we're going to challenge the, the, the long held assumption that physical side channels require physical proximity, intuitive though that assumption might be. Um, and we're going to do this by leveraging the fact that a laptop actually has everything needed to sort of measure itself. Um, so it has a microphone, obviously, and uh, this microphone is connected internally to the sound card using wires that go very close to where the CPU is. And this mirrors um, the, the picture of uh, an actual physical side, cha side channel attack that I showed a couple of slides ago, and that's not a coincidence. Maybe we can use these uh, emissions from uh, the CPU, um, and we can analyze what the sound card picks up from them. Uh, and to demonstrate the feasibility of this, the first thing we did was we wrote this program that iterates uh, infinitely over uh, 0.8 seconds of multiplication followed by 0.4 seconds of, of halting, so just sleeping. And we can see the, the same periodicity of this program. We can see um, it happening in the, uh, the visualization of the signal captured in the um, by the microphone visualization visualized as a spectrogram. So the... <clears throat> Uh, vertical axis is frequency and the, uh, sorry, the horizontal axis is frequency, the vertical, ac vertical axis is time, and we can see the same periods of multiplication and then sleeping in the signal. So we know that the sound card does pick up on leakage from the CPU. Uh, operations performed by the CPU appear on this on the sound card's uh, signal. Uh, this happens across many devices. So basically every laptop we experimented with, we saw the same pattern where we could see computation on the signal recorded by the microphone. And that's nice. Uh, but it's even nicer if it happens over, uh, if, if the, the signal is recoverable by the other part, by the other end of a voice over IP call, because then we can hope that, that the, this attack can be mounted remotely. So uh, we transmitted the signal while running this uh, program that has multiplication and then sleeping. We transmitted the signal to another party using common uh, voice over IP applications. And every time we saw the same pattern where the computation of the CPU or the patterns that we introduced into the computations of the CPU are observable by the other uh, party in the voice over IP connection, which was cool. But this is not what we're about. We want to mount an actual attack and we want to identify websites if we can. So uh, to do that, we are assuming that the victim is conversing using some voice over IP software with an attacker uh, while they are visiting uh, Twitter or other websites. And, um, and the audio from the victim's environment, but also any, any signals that the microphone picked up are uh, transmitted to the attacker via the voice, voice over IP call. And the attacker is going to try to analyze them. We used convolutional neural networks to extract the identity of the websites. Uh, we could reach 94% accuracy for 14-way classification of websites, indicating that you can, uh, you can know, at least from a few common activities that the, the victim is performing, you can tell between them. Um, 
we have a deeper characterization of these numbers, including more using more websites in the paper. So I encourage you to check out the full paper. Now, website identification is a small is a is a closed world problem. Uh, so we're going to try to do cryptographic key extraction, which is always uh, uh, really nice with uh, with side channels. Um, and specifically, we're assuming the victim is performing uh, libgcrypt signing using ECDSA, using the libgcrypt implementation of ECDSA. Um, and they're on a voice over IP call again with the attacker. And the attacker is going to try to recover the victim's secret signing key from the um, from just the, the call while from having a call with them while they are uh, signing messages. And um, so we're going to use a uh, vulnerability of the ECDSA implementation, and uh, it goes something like this. So ECDSA has three uh, um, components, key generation, signing, and verification. The signing operation uh, has a scalar point, point multiplication where the scalar is supposed to be kept secret. Because it's supposed to be kept secret, it has constant time implementation, but as Minerva found out, and published uh, this constant time is uh, is buggy in um, in the sense that um, that uh, the loop that um, implements one of the loops that implement the multiplication it skips skips the leading zeros in the um, in the knots um, and the this results in a linear dependency between the, the nonce and the signing time. I forgot to say the scalar is just a random nonce, but uh, but it's supposed to be kept secret again. So um, so there's a linear dependency between the bit length of the nonce and the signing time. Um, and so um, we are going to do some signal processing uh, to try to infer this signing time, oh, something like that. So we're going to take uh, si the signal transmitted uh, Sorry, transform it to the to the time domain, uh, and then we're going to do a band pass and demodulation. And what uh, this results in is, is this nice uh, signal where there is a valley in it, and we can we know that the valley corresponds to the signature time, uh, but it only noisily corresponds to the signature time. So unfortunately, um, it's not we can't directly use that as signature time otherwise we would not get very good results and we would not be able to recover the key so what we are going to do is we're going to denoise it and we're specifically going to to use um ecdsa implementation rfc um 6979 where the nonce is deterministically derived from the key and from the message and so we're going to group the traces by their message they're all use the same key so they're all going to have the same nonce and uh we're going to use the fact that the uh the nonce is deterministically derived to denoise and we're basically going to um be able to average out a lot of uh different uh signing operation traces um to denoise them and then we're going to se select the, the shortest signatures. Now, the shortest signatures, we know a lot of the leading bits. And once we have enough uh, key, enough traces of or enough messages for which we know the signature and the uh, leading bits of it, then we can use the lattice attack of Albrecht and Henninger. This is exactly what we did. And we were able to extract the key from traces of 20,000 signed messages, each repeated 91 times. Um, and I think this happened in like 20 minutes once we collected all the traces. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about our killer app, so to speak. Uh, it's a, we're going to use our side channel to cheat on Counter-Strike. And Counter-Strike is, you know, it sounds funny, but some people take it very seriously. It's a, it could be considered a, a classic example of an eSport that's played competitively and many people take it very seriously. Um, and uh, and here we have a similar attacker model, except uh, the victim is trying to do something different. I'll get to that. But in our attacker model, the victim is, uh, again, uh, is playing against the attacker. Uh, they are on, the, on a voice over IP call with them, which is actually common if they're playing one-on-one -on -one against each other. And uh, again, they're transmitting, like audio is being transmitted to the attacker. And the attacker is going to try to say that the victim is hiding behind some corner. 
because Counter Strike has a bunch of uh, corners and nooks that that people can that their avatars of people in the game can hide behind, and uh, it's definitely some somebody who's playing against you will definitely want to know where you are. So the, and to this is there's going to be a demonstration. So just so you you see, uh, this is where the uh, victim is. This is sorry, this is where the attacker is. This is where the victim is. They, they basically don't know where each other is. So they, it would be useful if they can find out. And we're going to use the fact that. When the attacker uh, becomes, when the attacker go, get, goes into the victim's line of sight, the victim's laptop will actually be rendering the attacker's avatar. So the attacker is going to move in and out of the victim's line of sight, uh, still hidden behind an object, so they can't reveal them, so they can't actually see them, but they will, um, their machine will render their avatar, even though they can't see them. That's just some technical part of how uh, Counter Strike works. Uh, and uh, this looks like this. Uh, so the attacker is moving to the right hand side of the truck where they see this pattern of uh, stripes on their signal spectrogram. And then they're moving left and they don't see this pattern anymore. And then they're moving to the right and the pattern changes again. And again, you see these stripes. So they know that the, the pattern indicates rendering. So they know that the victim is uh, hiding on the right-hand side of the truck. And they step out of the truck and they flank the victim and they kill them from behind. And this concludes the uh, Counter-Strike attack. Uh, I certainly encourage you to check out the paper. It has a lot of other cool stuff in it. And with this, we will conclude and take questions.